this is my top five REM records. Um, I've done two other parts. Well, actually three because I had an introduction where I counted down number 15 to 11 and then number 10 through 6. This is all REM studio records, no live records, no um, greatest hits, certainly. No um, B-side collection or EP. Um, I might get to that, some of that stuff at a, a later time. And I'm certainly not done talking about REM just because I'm doing this countdown. They're one of my favorite bands. So if you're a subscriber to this channel, please uh, know that you'll hear more about this band at some point. And if you're uh, not a subscriber and you love REM, well, I, I definitely talk about them a, a fair amount on here. Um, I have some thoughts about, some misgivings about some of the decisions I made earlier in, in the ranking this could change by the day for me and i've done this over a period of a couple of weeks so it does um and some people's comments too i mean no one of them like accelerate should be rated higher i, I tend to agree problem is they just have so many good albums one thing i don't think is going to change at all though is my top five um these five records are in there for a reason and some of these records might not have been in there 10 years ago um they'd still be probably in the top 10 i think for sure but uh anyway the phenomenal band and these all are phenomenal records we'll start with the one that sort of began it all for me document i talked earlier about hearing murmur um the cassette and liking a couple songs but not really getting it and then i heard follow me on the radio but i don't know if i always knew it was rem and I, every time it would come on though i was like whoa what is this and finally figured out who it was. I was super intrigued. I remember thinking he had such a baritone. Now I don't even really think about that. I thought he had such a low voice. Um, and then the one I love came out. And when that hit radio, I was so intrigued. I was like, okay, I got it. I got to get some REM records. And I ended up going to the record store and buying documents and like search pageant the album before it on the same day must have had some money from my fast food gig burning a hole in my pocket but i can't say that i've ever spent what would that be 20 bucks better maybe in my life than than these getting these two records that kind of kicked off a, a whole lot of musical exploration for me and uh, really finding music that spoke to me um and di i didn't feel like it was um kind of a carryover for some from some era that I missed, right? This was current, so current. This album almost reads like a newspaper when you hear it. Super political, super upfront about, you know, lyrics you can hear everything. I think probably on Life Search Pageant you could quite a bit too, but here it feels very current. You're talking about Central America talking about McCarthyism um, from the past, maybe coming up again, um, exhuming McCarthy. Uh, and the world as we know it, just dropping names left and right. Uh, you know, for somebody who's 15 years old and this comes out, you're like, wait, wait, who are these people? You know, I knew some of them, but I'm just wanting to understand more and more um, about the subject matter and enjoying the hell out of the listening experience because it rocks and sounds so good. It, it, I don't know if it's aged very well. You know, a lot of people, I think if you got into this later, it might be kind of a, a little hard to get into maybe. Um, I love how outspoken it is. I love that it just it just is in your face. Um, when things got really dark, well, darker, you know, politically, um, I remember just cranking this up in my car and just feeling like it was just, like it was written yesterday, which is kind of sad. But killer record the one i love killer pop song really weird you know kind of a strange one if you think about it i mean it's kind of like every breath you take uh it's 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 kind of a um, unpleasant love song not a love song kind of a i'm just using you for sex essentially song a simple prop to occupy my time Ugh, this one goes out to the one i love um but of course everybody everybody a lot of people mis misconstrued that song um, end of the world as we know it. I'd never heard anything like that before. And I'd never, I don't think I'd heard subterranean homesick blues yet, but I still think the song's different enough where, I mean, it's just kind of similar vocal delivery. Um, the second sign gets a little weirder fireplace, um, lightning Hopkins. 
kind of a you've got some horns for the first time on REM records. Um, I think the the brilliant stuff is really probably on side one, um, especially the end of the world as we know it, and the the harmonies that Nils is doing, the counter harmonies, the counter melodies over Stipe's lyrics. Uh, I do love King of Birds though on side two, gorgeous song, and Odd Fellows One Five One's kind of a weird song, but I kind of like these REM songs that are still weird after all these years where you're like still don't totally have a grasp on it. That always sounds good. Definitely not one that makes me get up and skip by any stretch of the imagination. And this album introduced me to Wire. It would take a little while, maybe a year. Uh, probably not even that long. Um, they introduced me to so many bands. I remember buying Pink Flag in, a, I think, a kind of a bargain bin type thing on cassette. But their cover of Strange uh, is great. And you know, he changes the names to, to members of the band, um, Stipe does. And when I heard the original, I was shocked at how slow it was. I thought it would be a kind of a cranked up song that the way that REM covered it, the way they cover it, sound it fits right in with all the other songs. Disturbance at the Heron House, another really really good highlight of this record. Um, it just fits right in that like five song sequence on side one. But this is document. Um, another thing that I mentioned about this, um, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but I saw them live. I got this album. I got the other three um i was missing or no other other three if you include the ep um uh so i had all the all the records and by the or maybe four if you include dead Lower office i had all the rem records that were available let's just put it that way by the time i saw them live like a month after six weeks after i got this record and when I came from, and it changed the way I look at live music, and I, I'm sure I talked that about that before, but when I got home from school that day, the day after I saw R.E.M., I'm wearing the shirt that I bought at the show. I'm wearing it. I get home, I get my Rolling Stone magazine, and on the cover it says, they're on the cover, R.E.M., and it says, America's Best Rock and Roll Band. I was like, yeah, wow, wow, I just saw that. And some people will say, you know, are REM the best American rock and roll band? I don't know if it's because I identify with this band so much. And I saw them at small places or a small place before they exploded. And then I followed them forever. Um, there's a sense of like almost ownership or they feel not like peers. It's, it's the wrong way to put it. And they're older than I am. But uh, it felt like our music, our music, my music, our music, like this generation's music. And so it's kind of weird to think, like, was I witness to that? The best American rock and roll band? I think I was. There's not a... I, they're, yeah, they were phenomenal. Um, and this album is a hell of a gateway into um, R.E.M., especially if you're, uh, I don't know, 15 in 1987. Yes, yes, document number five. Number four. Now, this was the follow-up to Document, Green. It came out only a year later, um, and it's their major label debut on Warner Brothers. It sounds... I remember it sounded... I remember being let down by it when I first heard it because I thought it sounded slight. I mean, even the album cover looks kind of slight. Uh, it, it just looks like some kind of graphic that could be carried over from document um but there are riches in this record and this is one that my appreciation of it has just gone through the roof uh, in the last like five to ten years i listen to this record probably more than any other rem record i think it I don't, I don't know it just sounds great it's divided into like three different types of songs really maybe even four You've got the acoustic, more stripped-down stuff like um, World Leader Pretend, You Are the Everything, Hair Shirt, and one of my absolute favorite R.E.M. songs that not enough people know, not enough people appreciate, The Wrong Child. Sit down and listen to that song if you haven't heard it before. It's just gorgeous. And, uh, yeah. And then, yeah, so you've got the acoustic, more, more stripped-down type stuff, and then you've got uh, pop stuff, pop um, I never heard something like, should we talk about the weather? Should we talk about the government? You know, pop song 89 before I never heard something like get up. Those songs don't bother me. I like them. They're, they're, um, they're just fun. And, uh, that was great on the green tour too. Uh, I remember both those songs were, were highlights. Um, 
the other pop song stand i didn't like at first i was like oh god you know i wanted people you know you get you get defensive of of your uh your favorite band right you want people to hear the really good stuff and so i kind of was like uh stand uh, uh you know orange crush you know let's talk about that or should we talk about the weather should we talk about the government let's t- should we listen to uh world leader pretend or, or some other song to represent this record I've since kind of changed my mind on it. I've always liked how it just like, totally um, uh, goes up like a key in the, in the middle of the song. I like the uh, I like the sense of self, where you are, the like pride and where you're from, and maybe just where you're standing at that particular time and taking ownership of it. So I'd appreciate it more, and it certainly doesn't bother me like shiny happy people bothers me, which I wish had just never existed. Um, yeah, it's 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 a good song. It's fun. The fourth kind of song, I guess, might be uh, the last song, which is Untitled, song number 11. Just, I mean, it's interesting because they switch, they switch all instruments. I think they did a little bit of that anyway on Green. But it's this great little bonus song. Sees him kind of longing to, to reach out and uh, touch the people that he misses by being on the road. Um He's going to be home soon. I think he wrote it for his his parents, maybe. Uh, just gorgeous, gorgeous little song. Um, and kind of poppy at the same time. I love it. It always, it, I think it's a, probably one of their best album enders, that song, um, Eleven. And, you know, everybody, you know, some people are like, oh, it's R.E.M. selling out. I'm like, where? Okay, maybe Stan, maybe, but was that what you would think of of rem selling out like get a major label contract and then they do a song like stand that certainly doesn't seem like the type of thing that's going to be all over the radio i mean it's weird and it's poppy but it is weird uh you know the one i love was a much better single i think than orange crush uh, it was much more interesting although i love 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 orange crush i think it just rocks it's always a highlight of seeing them live i will i always i love that album it comes on the radio uh, I'm turning it up. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's one of REM's weirder, more interesting record that just reveals itself a lot over time. You have a lot of introduction of elements to their sound that will blossom further on um, out of time a little bit, but majorly so on Automatic for the People. You Are the Everything, you know, World Leader Pretend, that, that sort of sound gets expanded on the much more stripped down, interesting, weirder REM kind of just trying on, trying something new. And that, that's really what, what green was, but it also capitalizes a lot on their strengths. They had absolutely love green. And it is my number four, number three, uh, some point times has been my number one. I love reckoning. Reckoning is just, to me, it's a sound of REM. Um, murmur sounds like a studio creation to some extent, um, REM become much more like uh, like they are live on this record. It just sounds like it was not fussed over that they wrote some really solid songs, went in the studio and banged it out. And it just has a certain magic to it. It's very cohesive. It plays really well all the way, just beginning to end. It sustains a mood really well, even when you get into like time after time, which you, we all know isn't Steve Malcolmus's favorite REM song. And uh, camera, you know, kind of gorgeous, gorgeous uh, tribute to a, I think a friend who had passed away, a friend of Stipes. And then you have something like um, "Don't Go Back to Rockville," which Bill Barry and I, Mike Mills for sure, but I think Bill Barry too, wrote that in a pre REM band that they were both in. Definitely provides almost like a country rock song for them. Totally different. Um, Stipe would stop singing it live and mills would sort of take over on the last several tours they did and they played that song um but it's those first three songs for me it's just harbor coat uh i always want to say voice of herald um seven chinese brothers which the b-side of of i think southern central rain which is the third song uh was voice of herald which is um seven chinese brothers with different lyrics that he that stipe took from uh religious record i mean it is one of the it is amazing it, you like i i, I kind of prefer it to um seven chinese brothers it, the humor in it the fact that he could do it and make it sound good the southernness of it his accent he kind of plays up 
Southern Central Rain or South Central Rain was a song they played on, on Letterman when promoting Murmur. It didn't even have a title yet. If you watch that clip, Stipe is incredibly uncomfortable at the end of the interview, trying to avoid Letterman. It's kind of funny. Um, I just think it's a great REM record. It just plays really well. It rocks. It is um, always one that gets me in a better mood. I've always loved the album cover by Howard Finster. Um, he went on to do uh, um, Talking Heads, Little Creatures. He does that as well. And I think they're shooting video in his backyard garden weird eclectic garden i think when um for left of reckoning which the the album the first side's called l or left and the second side's r or right and they shot a video for the whole first side of the record and when I, oftentimes when i listen to this record it's sort of in the fall and it i think i'm trying to evoke that feeling i got from watching that even though i haven't seen it in years but to me it's a fall record even though it came out in the spring and it's my number three, and uh, yeah, love it. Love, 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 love um, Reckoning. Okay, uh, okay, number two and number one. Let's talk about this for a second. I was sure what my number one was, and in fact, I was going between this being number three or this being number two, and my number two being my number three. Then I sat down and, and, and listened to this record I'm going to show next uh, between two speakers at night clean copy i just cleaned it um and it was absolutely jaw-droppingly gorgeous and it, it felt like one of the first times i got to listen to it and i was just like holy shit <laughs> am i really not gonna have this at number one but for reasons i will get into um very soon here it is my number two and that is rem's automatic for the people like i said just gorgeous stunning um i was a sophomore i think in college going through a kind of a tough time uh, maybe it's just becoming a junior and uh things were not good and i was kind of uh isolated didn't go out much and my friend worked at the radio station, the college radio station. And he brought home, or brought me over. We were roommates before that. Yeah, I was living in a different place. But he brought he brought over an advanced CD of Automatic for the People on Friday. And it came out on a Tuesday. So I had the whole weekend to listen to this record before, I guess, everybody else heard it. Everybody else bought it. I remember putting headphones on, turned up to a pretty decent volume and being absolutely floored. This band that I got into in 87, it was now 92, five years going from seeing them in a small um, concert hall to them being a major, major band, even on the Green Tour, you know, they're, they're playing much bigger places. But by the time that Automatic, or by the time that um, Out of Time came out, you know, they were a household name. Like it, it was, everybody knew losing my religion. Um, and unfortunately a lot of them knew shiny, happy people too. But when I put this record on and I, I played it and listened to it with headphones, my thought was these guys have graduated to the big time. These guys have gone where, where the classics that I, that are up there with the best records in the world, um, for rock and roll, they, they belong in that, that pantheon now. Uh, they have made something that is truly unbelievably, unbelievably good. Um, and it was a shift in direction, too. I love the strings. I love Drive. I know it probably wasn't the best single for um, commercial-wise, oh, but, well, they made up for it label later with this record. I absolutely love that. I didn't like hearing Losing My Religion in advance. It didn't do much for me. Drive did. Drive, there's just something about, like, holy crap, this band is not going to go pop or not going to give us more um, of like out of time type stuff. They're shifting directions and they're doing something way different here. Even though there's songs like Half Half um, A World Away or something like Low Off Out of Time, it's nothing like what you're getting here. This orchestration, these, these layers of sound, these um, really powerful lyrics, powerful storytelling, um, and it's dark, and very dark. You know? But it's it's also a very optimistic record too. Uh, there there's a lot of light in there. 
but I mean, he's, you know, they're dealing with, I guess, turning 30, which seems laughable now, you know, um, seems quite young to me, but, uh, you know, dealing with all the life changes. I mean, they're at the top of the world They're They've got everything they ever wanted to do. Okay. What next? And, uh, they, they made this record and I think it was probably a welcome retreat from the attention they were getting at the time. And yeah, I just remember just being absolutely blown away Pro- for sure. Um, by the time I got to everybody hurts, you know, just like, Oh my God. Now that song's lost a lot of its power. That's a, that's the thing I don't like about singles and things just being played to death is now, you know, you can almost cringe when you hear that, but my God, is that a powerful song and just was so beautiful when it came out. And then the perfect segue from that into, um, I think it's called new Orleans instrumental number two, uh, or one, um, beautiful and goes right into sweetness follows which is probably you know the most uh sad song on here i always see see it as his attempt to um connect with his his siblings over the loss of their parents or kind of realizing what life's really about um i looked at take a look at the lyrics recently and kind of discover some new things I, i never really knew like i've always kind of been somewhat puzzled by the inclusion of sidewinder sleeps tonight although i think it sounds great and i love the orchestration that goes through that too it's just uh seems a little out of left field for this record you know and sidewinder is much much more interesting if you actually pull up the lyrics which i respected rem for not including lyrics but i kind of wish they would have on some of these records and especially this one um it's just so rich lyrically and i don't because they're not printed, I don't often look them up. You know, I listened to this record before the internet existed, uh, or at least not not the way we know it now. Um, and yeah, was used to just trying to make them out. But yeah, you actually sit down and, and even something like Sidewinder Sleeps Tonight, quite lyrically uh, great. Um, he says there are scratches all around the coin slot. You know, he's like desperately trying to get a hold of this person. Call me when you try to wake her up. On Out of Time, they kind of shied away from politics, didn't really address much of anything. Um, Even Green isn't very political outside of Orange Crush. I remember Stipe saying that if he wants to talk about politics now, he'll just hold a press conference. Um, There is one song, though, on Automatic for the People that is a bit of a head-scratcher, kind of like Sidewinder Sleeps Tonight, a little bit, but it's more out of left field. And that's Ignore Land, because it's kind of like a, a rock song, kind of a funky rock song um, in the middle of Automatic for the People. I like the way this album is sequenced on vinyl. I bought it in the CD era and listened to it from start to finish, but I like that Ignore Land is the first song on side two. I think that works much better with the flow. Have a little break, start it with Ignore Land and go from there. And it is like probably them at their most political, and there are some lyrics in here that I honestly never knew he was saying which i makes me like this song more uh the directness of it i'll just read part of this up the republic my skinny ass tv tells a million lies the paper's terrified to report anything that isn't handed on a presidential spoon i'm just profoundly frustrated by all this so fuck you man and then fuck him and then it goes into the chorus i i had no idea that there was actually like that straightforward in here things then go back on back into that kind of melancholy mood continue with the mood of the the dominant mood of most of the record um with uh songs like starmy kitten which again looking at the lyrics uh interesting just changing the locks on uh as a metaphor for a relationship and then wondering if he should give the person a key and just kind of wants to hook up with them maybe one last time kind of similar to to the one i love although i think you get more heart and um in star me kitten than you do the other one um and they called it star because of they didn't want to write the word fuck on their on their album sleeve and probably not have it show up in walmart or whatever and money got a raw deal Ten, people tend to forget about that montgomery cliff singing about him uh interesting song i always thought it sounded very similar to man on the moon i think when it when i first heard the record i got the two confused sometimes now of course i wouldn't a man on the moon what a gem too i mean another one that's been overplayed a lot uh apparently he was the album was finished and the band really liked that song a lot and stipe couldn't really wasn't completing it and they just kind of begged him to and he walked around seattle for hours 
and wrote the lyrics and came back in and did it and like the album the tapes were sent like the next day to the to the record label so uh, yeah we almost didn't have man on the moon which is now probably one of their most well-known songs and a really interesting song too you know andy kaufman being the subject matter but you know faith versus uh versus uh illusion illusions versus reality what, what do you choose to believe in i don't know I, i'm not going to get in stipe's head too much with that one but move, moves on to the next song night swimming which is just gorgeous gorgeous i mean so many gorgeous songs in here uh the strings come back uh just creating this perfect summer mood that we all probably remember having nights similar to this where you're with your friends it's late you're probably doing something you shouldn't be doing in this case you know skinny dipping uh and just the beauty in that the the innocence of that um and yeah he just captures it so well and so poetically and just gorgeous gorgeous song instrumentally um yeah fantastic and then you close with find the river which is just this gorgeous song uh feels more stripped down more um more uh kind of things wrapping to a conclusion it sort of has that feel to it it's a gorgeous way to end this record and this record is it is that record that is just like a crowning achievement for them it sounds amazing it is truly timeless and it's a lot of people's number one record and the only reason only reason it is not my number one record is because then this record could not be number one. And this is Life's Rich Pageant. I love the shit out of this record. This is my favorite REM record. It's gone back and forth before this, between this and Reckoning sometimes, and sometimes um, Automatic for the People too. But so much of what they, they did, I think, started on this record. This is where it all comes together. This is where clarity comes in. This is where a political consciousness is, is, is heard. Uh, this is where they start to rock the sound of them live you kind of could hear on reckoning but this is like a bigger sound I remember when it came out uh, peter buck or i think it was on document tour when he's talking about the new album at the time uh was saying that this was his this was their brian adams record and i remember thinking oh yeah it's kind of poppy compared to um document i, I don't i don't know now i just just hear like a just a great great record um the muscular record uh a record of focus uh it's not like document it's political but it's not directed at anyone in particular as much it's more like a call to arms for youth it's like the one that really makes me feel or made me feel like i was part of something like it felt like he was really talking to to us they were talking to us they're our band we were the audience it wasn't some baby boomer watered down version that's kicking out records in 86 this was a band that was made for that time period and was super active and making incredible music and doing things that a lot of bands did not do i mean yeah a lot of bands were political the punk scene and stuff like that but this is like this is um marrying all that with with big rock hooks and and they still got the mystery going on there but i know it was like very difficult to record apparently with um don gam i'm probably not pronouncing that last name right he was a producer on this record you know especially for stipe i think it was kind of a nightmare because he really drove him hard now apparently you know what is the song about what are you trying to say <laughs> which you know hey i'm sure it was super annoying because he did that on the three records that came before this but this one even if you look at like like swan swan hummingbird and go okay that's like a civil war type song wasn't he singing about or that's like a reconstruction type song wasn't he singing about that um on uh, the same subject matter on um fables of the reconstruction or reconstruction of the fables but there's so much more clarity there you, i mean it's still a little like okay he's using all these sayings he's found in different places but it's so intriguing and so interesting and and poetic um you can tell the, these lyrics are really well thought of and um polished polished up a little bit uh mostly for me it's that it's a one-two bang of begin and begin and these days again kind of like a call to arms like that feels like it's talking to people like it's like stipe talking to himself like let's get on with it these are this is our time and it felt like that for me it felt like he was talking to me you know music that seems very very personal um again not something i that was from the 60s or from the 70s but right now right at that time and and i just absolutely loved it um especially yeah those two songs but also a song like i believe you know 
I mean, yeah, some of the lyrics are like, "What? Wait, what? You know, I believe in, I believe my throat hurts, you know, stuff like that. But there's also, there's also so many just goofiness and interesting things that you would just never hear. Banjos coming in at different times, weird lyrics, inscrutable lyrics, but, but like becoming more and more focused. And uh, I don't know. It's just like the way his vocals are recorded, Stipes, the way the band just drives these songs, uh, Fall on Me, absolutely gorgeous interesting really intriguing pop song even now um kind of does what they do best i think supposedly about acid rain but you get something like cuyahoga crystal clear i mean native americans use of cuyahoga river the symbolic um, nature of the river um and then also the pollution of the river and just Again, masterful lyrics. I especially love the line where he's, you know, this is where we walk, this is where we swam. He does that several times, but then towards the end he does, this is where we walk, swam, hunted, danced, and sang. I'm like, oh my god, like that always blows me away that he was able to kind of like um, summarize everything that he was saying in the, in the verses in one line like that. Um, yeah, I probably sound like I'm 15 talking about this record, but I love, I love this record. Um, even the goofy stuff. There's some throwaway material here, but I wouldn't take anything off. Uh, it kind of works in context. Underneath the Bunker, I mean, is about as far away from a Brian Adams record as you can get. Uh, you know, what is it banjo he's playing? And it's just Stipe singing some nonsense over it. And it's a really short song. But they, you've got songs that are left over, I think, from uh, early incarnations of or earlier um, sessions or albums not even albums, just uh, songs they were working on early on, like Just a Touch, that supposedly is about um, the lines of communication, people communicating or sharing the news that Elvis died, and Just a Touch was apparently the name of a cover band um, that was playing the night of Elvis's death. Who knows what the real story is and all that, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, Kevin heard it on the radio. Uh, Hyena, not really sure what that one's about, but it just kind of rocks. It's great. Um, what if we give it away? Uh, it might be the one, the one I would could probably give that one away, maybe. Again, though, I it, it all works, and it's a short album, and no, no none of these songs overstay their welcome. Um, I believe Killer, uh, Flowers of Guatemala, uh, you know, absolutely gorgeous song. I've always loved that song. Um, I was taking a look look at the lyrics recently he talks about this flower called amanita and supposedly this flower is uh psychedelic and you can trip off of it and if you listen to the the lyrics through that context it takes on a different meaning i've often read that it's like the mass about the mass casualties of the war that was going on and probably 10 years before he wrote the song in guatemala um either way it works. I think I admire him, Stipe, for not talking about his lyrics that much. Although I always love it when he does, honestly. But you do have, if you are willing to pull them up, and because they're not printed on inside, and look at them, um, they oh, they can really reward, really reward you. And believe it or not, this is something that I've never. You'd think that when the internet first came out, I'd be like looking up lyrics to to Murmur and Reckoning and this album. Not so much. Um, I think I'd had just. They just worked the way they were. I understood enough to know what the songs were about to me, but boy, it can take on a whole different, um, whole different meaning when you when you um, sit down and really study them. Because by this point, he was writing very, very good lyrics. Uh, there's, you know, some people would say Superman's a throwaway song. It's the first time Mike Mills performs on the record, on a Re REM record, and it just is so much fun. It's this uh, cover song of this obscure 60s band called The Click, I think. And it works brilliantly to close out the record. It's just like this this record is just like a, a dose of fun, of politics, of a call, not even politics, a call to arms to like do your thing, get up, you're part of this world. Um, and beauty, beautiful, you know, um, songs like Swan Swan Hummingbird and Fall on Me and uh, Flowers of Guatemala. But it all just sounds so right. There's so much of what they would they would become in this record, what they would build off of. Um, Automatic for the people cannot have happened, I think, without the the building blocks of this kind of record getting there. The, the more of the clarity, and also stripping things down a little bit. 
um, on some songs. And, you know, this is the rock kind of sound I think they were trying to get back to when they did something like Accelerate, you know. Uh, what? 20 years later or something like that? I don't even want to do the math. It just makes me feel old. But yes, Life Search Pageant is my number one. And neck and neck with Automatic, um, but I have to be true to what I really listen to sometimes too, or what when I think of REM, if I'm going to tell somebody like, you got to get one record. I mean, it might be this one. It probably is this one, but I'd be quick to mention many other records too. I have a bad cold and this has been kind of difficult. So I'm going to sign off, but this is my countdown of the top five REM records. Thanks.